here's an interesting player, and that is Javon McKinley. I'm just going to turn it over to you and say, what are your thoughts on Javon McKinley? Do you think he has a guy that has a chance to be drafted? And what does he have to do between now and draft day to get himself on people's boards or more so to get him up on people's boards? He has to test well. Like when that pro day is, he has to show out because again, we're in a draft season this year in 2021 where there are limited opportunities to showcase your talents. So he really needs to leave a lasting impression as an athlete. He was a guy that was another high recruit that a lot of people were excited about. You know, he had some out insane film coming out of high school, like just some out like one handed catches left and right. And it was mm-hmm. a lot of fun. And a lot of guys had, I know had high expectations for him. Um, I know he dealt with, you know, with a little bit of issues and inconsistencies and wasn't able to break out until he was a senior, but he had, some nice moments this past year, you know, with the 2020 season, he's a leading receiver. He had some nice, nice games, um, some nice moments. There's some good film to, to kind of get your back onto. And, and, you know, just talking before the show, uh, there's a deep belief that he is going to test a lot better than maybe a lot of people anticipate. So now we're talking about a guy that has good size, good length to him, had some production last year that you're looking at. And plus if he's able to test well, then I think that he deserves potentially a late round option. Um, it just it's going to really be dependent on one single day for him, unfortunately, this year with mm-hmm. no all star appearance. Uh, we're going to have to see for him just what type of athlete he tests at. It's it's going to be for him. What is your last impression mm-hmm. in this draft process? The interesting thing about Javon McKinley is uh, it, it's the same argument I had with people leading up to the 2018 draft and the 2019 draft. I kept arguing with people last year. Chase Claypool's faster than you think. He's open a lot more than you think he is when you're watching it on television. I'm at games. I'm in the press box. The dude's getting open a lot more. I think a couple of things that helped them this year is he had his best games in the biggest moments. I mean, he he smoked Asante Samuel a couple of times. He's going to be a day two, early day three pick, I would imagine. Correct? Asante Samuel from Florida State. Yep. Um, smoked Clemson. You know, he had five catches for over 100 yards against Clemson, had six catches for over 120 yards against North Carolina. And there's going to be a clip of him. The only chance he had to make a play on Caleb Farley in 2019, he beat him, you know, beat him off the ball and beat him on the back shoulder catch. So I think the fact that he did play so well in in, in big moments and, and there were games where he was getting open, he just wasn't getting the ball. It was going to be a similar evaluation to what people said about Chase Claypool last year. Um, so but to your point, though, when you look at the lack of overall production, it, it, what they're not going to – I mean, I, I'm curious what NFL teams are going to hear. I was told by coaches at Notre Dame in 2018 and 2019 that there were stretches of the season where Javon McKinley was their best receiver in practice. They just couldn't do it consistently, and he couldn't stay healthy. And I think that's going to be a, a, a concern for him is the fact he has so many injury I- issues. He did have the arrest that he had a couple years ago, which is going to be a, a red flag. But I think – That's going to be somewhat negated. He was also a first-team all-academic player in the ACC this year. I I think that was sort of one of those things where that was a kid who had a really bad day as opposed to a kid that has a systemic problem of of getting in trouble. They're they're not going to find that. They're going to find he did something really stupid, got in trouble for it, paid his, his, you know – uh, you know, paid the price for it. He came back and he was a, a you know a good member of the team since then, which is why he came back as a fifth year senior. Notre Dame it does not bring back fifth year seniors just because of football. If you don't pass the off the field stuff, they won't bring you back. They don't care if you're a first round pick. Um, so the fact that the university brought him back, I think, speaks volumes to his overall career as a student there. Um, all of that said, there's just so many things pulling back and forth: good, bad, good, bad. To your point, that's why the pro day is going to be so important for him. He's going to have to be a 4-4, somewhere in the 4-4. I think if he's in the 4-4, that's going to that's going to say, okay, I loved the film, check, 4-4-8. That, there you go. Mm-hmm. And I think then he is a draftable guy. If he runs in the mid to high 4-5s or worse – I, I don't I just don't see a team taking a chance on him. But the interesting thing though is is I I, I won't be shocked if he runs a four four. I I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday. Going back to two thousand seven. Now let's remember who Notre Dame has had at receiver since two thousand seven. Right, there have been four seasons where a Notre Dame receiver had forty or more catches and averaged over seventeen yards a catch. Golden Tate in two thousand eight. Michael Floyd in two thousand eight. They had a pretty good quarterback throwing the ball that year. Will Fuller in 2015 and Javon McKinley in 2020. That's it. So the knock that, well, he's he's a possession guy. Based on what? <laughs> His film doesn't say that. His Brian, film says big, he can get big. down. A, 
He's right. big. He has to be a possession receiver. And that's the, that was the same thing we heard about Miles Boykin, and it was the same thing we heard about Chase Claypool. I kept, look, Chase Claypool is a freak athlete. He is not a catch a hitch route and you know curl routes all day. He is, a, and we saw that this year at the Steelers. So I think Javon isn't the explosive athlete that those two guys are. That's the difference. Like I think he'll test better in a forty. But I don't see him jumping 42 inches like those guys did, or, or or the broad jump that those guys did, and partly because he's had so many lower, he's had a, multiple lower body injuries. I think that's kind of sapped him a little bit. So I think it's not just about 40 time that NFL teams are going to be looking at, it, and it wasn't just 40 time that for those two guys, it was also great wingspan, which Javon will probably have. But it was the 40 plus inch vertical jump. It was the great uh, broad jump, and Miles. People forget Miles had one of the best shuttle times among the receivers of the combine, which was interesting because that does not show up on film at all. So I was really shocked by that. But, um, you know, like you said, though, he's going to need to do what they did. I mean, if Chase Claypool doesn't blow up at the combine last year, he's not getting picked by the Steelers. Well, maybe they would be smart enough to do it, but odds are he would have he fallen more. Same with Miles. If Miles Miles was a third – a 6'4", 220-pound guy that ran a 4'4", and jumped 40 inches still went in the third round. If he, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? And I think that's more of the comparison I see for Javon because Chase had a much longer career. You know, He was only the dude for one year, but he was playing all the way back to his sophomore year. Miles had one year plus one game, LSU plus one season. Yeah. Javon's another one where it's he just had one year, really. You know, and I'm curious to see how NFL teams look at that. What – let me wrap. Is this a kind of receiver class that allow will allow him to jump in? Because if he comes out last year with the same season, he ain't getting picked because <laughs> it was one of the most absurdly deep NFL receiver drafts I've ever seen. What is the draft class looking like this year? Could he could he slide in because of the draft class, or is it going to be another deep year where he's going to kind of get maybe pushed down further than he otherwise would? This receiver class this year might be better than last year's. Probably. From a depth like, standpoint, it, for, or just from a top. Well, top wow. definitely from the top. There's some people that are gonna, you know, there's some things to figure out because there's mm-hmm. a couple opt out guys at the top, namely Jamar Chase. Like some people are going to kind of have varying opinions on him, but I will say up top, I think it's better than last year, and I think the depth is just as strong. I think it mm-hmm. is very deep class. So, I mean, Javon Javon is going to have his. It's, it's going to have a little bit of a, a tough act here. He's going to really mm-hmm. need to impress because, again, like the limited opportunity coupled with the fact that it's such a deep class, yeah. it's going to be difficult for him, but just needs yeah. to try to get his opportunity in some way. Right. You know, because Jamar Chase really only played one full season as a starter, but, right. <laughs> but it was one, one of the his best one season ever. was 84 catches for 1,780 yards and 20 touchdowns. <laughs> That's a little, a little different of a one-year wonder kind of thing. You know, he played a little bit as a freshman, but yeah, that that. But those are the things that go into these draft decisions. People say, "Well, this guy was drafted higher than I thought." Well, it's a bad year at the draft in his draft class. You know, right. uh, this guy fell. I can't believe he fell. What's well, because it's a loaded year at his draft class, and those are some of the the hidden things that I think people on my side, the fans, the the college people, don't always get that that the the quality of your draft class is also going to impact your specific position. You know, because some teams, hey, we met our need. We got our need or or, you know, we could we could get an undrafted free agent receiver that's going to be as good as a kid we take in the sixth round. But we can't find a guard that's going to be as good as the guy we're going to take. And those things, that's what kind of makes the draft so interesting and, and fun to follow and watch is, is that aspect of it. But certainly going to be interesting. And that's what Notre Dame's pro day, I think, is the end of March. Mm-hmm. So he's a guy that to me, uh, is there anybody on the offense that you think has more at stake on the pro day than, than Javon or, or is it Tremble? You think him and Tremble probably have the two most at stake for the pro day? Yeah. Tremble was another guy that, uh, that, that came to mind pretty quick. Cause like you said, if he's, if he's, I mean, cause I think he's going to test very well. If he's mm-hmm. a guy that goes in there and only runs like a four, seven, five mm-hmm. or worse, then we're starting to right. think about what the upside is and just kind of put that into perspective, kind of going off your, your last point. It's like, yes, we need to, obviously understand what the the position group each year because last year if Tommy Tremble's in the draft last year he might be the first tight end drafted <laughs> it was that bad of a tight end the first two so, tight ends would have been Notre Dame guys there's no question about absolutely. it absolutely <laughs> yeah I mean it, it would have been a great debate like do you want to mm-hmm. you want the upside with Tommy Tremble right. or do you want Cole Komet who just had this great productive right. season so uh, just to kind of put that into perspective but I think that Tremble and McKinley are probably the two most to gain as far as the yeah. pro day numbers this year. 